So right. you, you work in pen testing. Do you do YouTube full time or do you work as a pen tester like on the I, I currently work as a network penetration tester, so I do bread teaming uh, and uh, network penetration testing. So YouTube is kind of like so something I just do as a hobby. And do you do YouTube like literally just to help people out? How did you like get into it? Did you think I need a resource like this on the internet that you didn't have previously? Yeah, so uh, usually when, when well, back in the day when I was uh, going around YouTube, essentially looking for infosec stuff, I wasn't able to find anything that was really convincing or anything that, that really helped me. So uh, that's when I actually decided to create the channel and uh, and have this sort of uh, as, as a place where you can get started and, and, uh, and obviously uh, get help in, in whatever uh, area that, that you need. Yeah, I saw on your website you have a, a section where people can literally just send you questions. Um, yeah. I thought that was quite good. I had never seen that before between a YouTuber and the fan base, mainly because the fan base is so large that it's hard to interact. Yeah. So I. Um, I yeah, sorry, go on. Uh, I usually have that. Uh, well, uh, I usually have multiple uh, lines of communication. So. If, if you have a, a very quick question, then you can always leave it, for example, in the comment section. If you have a personalized type of question, then emails or directly from the website, if, if that's if that's what uh, you want or that works for you. Yeah, of course, of course. I just like I, a lot of the the main tools and stuff like that. Those, the channels that produce that kind of content don't really have the potential to, to answer to all of their fans and stuff, especially in the comments, mainly because of the how like how massive the range is yeah what inspired you to start making youtube videos or was it a person or how did you start well uh, as i mentioned uh, it was all really about just making videos to help people so the first time i did it i actually quite enjoyed it i actually found a passion you know in explaining things uh, explaining things that seemed very complicated on the outside and sort of bringing them to people at a very basic level so that they, they can they can get a clearer picture of the idea so I, I, to answer your question, I really uh, enjoyed it from the beginning. Mm, mm, all right. So, so it's kind of just always been a thing that you've just wanted to do. Yeah. All right. Um, what's the favorite video that you've made so far? Which one was the most fun to make? Um, well, I have a lot of videos that I enjoyed making. I think if I was to pick one, I would probably, uh, it would probably be the, um, uh, the deep web video which I kind of made a long time ago uh, I would say about one or two years ago but uh, that was one that uh, had a sort of like a creative tangent to it so I really enjoyed making that video do you use the deep web a lot like I know it's a bit of a stereotype for, to be like oh hackers are always on the deep web but I, I personally don't use it that much uh, do you spend yeah, a lot of time I on that I actually use it for development and essentially just testing out websites. That's really what I, I use it for. I, I, I know a lot of people have a lot. There's a lot of cliche towards the deep web or the dark web or whatever you want to call it. And uh, I, I think that people are just missing the really good bits about how it can help people. So, yeah, I use it for development and testing uh, various web applications. Are there any main like benefits to using the deep web over surface web? Uh, yeah, one of them is privacy, of course. Using or uh, essentially passing your traffic through Tor is extremely helpful if that's what you're trying to achieve. If you're trying to achieve a certain level of anonymity, uh, you know, whatever you may be doing, whether you're a journalist or you're just trying to have your your traffic um, your traffic anonymized. Yeah, of course. Um, I've I've got quite a lot of friends that are into the security side of of the deep web and stuff like that, and they say that it's not actually that secure and uh, do you have any idea about anything to do with that? Or well, I, I think I think what they're talking about, what they uh, they sort of mean is first of all the whole uh, security, the browser security aspect of it. Where yes, you do have to have a certain level of understanding about the uh, about your browser security and how to secure yourself from hacks because it, it is a very gray area when it comes down to the internet. So usually you will find those type of people there when it comes down to uh, anonymizing yourself or getting sort of what I would call um, uh, uh, 
a good level of anonymity. Yes, a lot of people miss out uh, a lot of important bits like DNS settings, etc. So uh, I think that people just don't get uh, to see the the real picture behind it and understand it fully for what it is. Yeah, of course. Um, I, I recently saw, or well, recently, a couple months back, I saw uh, a zero-day exploit found in no scripts, which could literally just completely display someone's location just by changing their header from JavaScript to JSON. It was, it was yeah. such a simple concept, but just completely ruined the whole idea of Tor. Yeah, that's that's one of the issues we have uh, with, for example, browser plugins, is that they're developed by small teams or usually by one person. So... Uh, security isn't going to be one of their strong suits, and and again, I, I think it, it all comes down to, to just having um, uh, well, ex an example is is what you have right here: security-oriented community and sort of bringing the awareness to everyone, so that they're aware of the their uh, their browsers' uh, capabilities or their their limitations. Yeah, of course. Um, do you have any certificates? And if you do. Which ones do you find like the most useful to find a career or a job or just anything in the field? Well, yes, I do have a few certificates. And uh, I, I would say what, the, the ones that are the most important, of course, are going to be the ones that you choose to get depending on your line of career. But for me, I have the CEH, which is uh, really in retrospect is, is something that I, it hasn't really helped me a lot. Uh, I have the OSCP, which has been quite helpful, especially now, uh, given the fact that it's gaining a lot of popularity. Uh, but the most important one to me, or the one that's been the most helpful, is the Network Plus certification, which is something that not a lot of people in the InfoSec will talk about, but extremely important. Do you, so have you, what do you like feel is the most important? Do you, because I've, I've always heard just that as long as you've got OSCP, then you're just not going to have that much trouble finding a job since it's quite a recognized certificate. Yeah, well, you know, the the problem with uh, recommending certifications is they kind of throw away the part that you actually have to uh, work in the real world where things are not exactly going to be the way they were in the exam and everything is just sort of uh, in, it's it's sort of in, in, in limbo. So what, what, I, what I mean to say is, um, when it comes down to getting the information that you need, I would recommend learning f the, the, the basics first. Now, the basics can be sorted out in, in many different ways. But in my opinion, I feel like the, the most important thing to learn before you take any professional InfoSec certification is to get a good understanding of Linux and a good understanding of networking. Because I've seen various students come into OSCP not knowing about uh, Netstat, not knowing about IP tables, uh, various networking uh, the, uh, concepts that you really should know before you delve into in, into a, a sector that really requires that type of knowledge. So do you recommend people do uh, certificates such as CSEN or just something related to networking before going into hacking? Yeah, I, I, I actually don't recommend that you take a certificate. You don't need to. It's not something that you have to do, but I would recommend learning the basics of networking. And uh, as I said, the Network Plus certification is probably one of the best introductions into networking. And it'll give you all you, you pretty much need to know uh, to, to get started into, in, into, into uh, InfoSec. Sorry about that. Yeah, of course. Um, and in your spare time, apart from content creation, what do you enjoy doing? Uh, well, I work, as I said, uh, full-time as a network penetration tester. What I do as well is I'm a web developer. Uh, I think I've mentioned that previously, but anyway, I am a web developer. Oh, that, that, that's, that's really like, useful to have such a vast knowledge of web security and cybersecurity and be a web developer. Yeah, it's uh, it's really helpful, and that's probably where I got started. Really, uh, I remember when I was in high school, you know, getting started with programming. Uh, I I learned HTML and a bit of CSS, and for some reason, I just jumped straight to PHP, which was uh, I I still hold that language in in very very high favor till today. And that's where I learned about you know PHP security, and that's when it started getting really really interesting. Yeah, of course, of course. Um what about like category wise what do you enjoy doing the most do you enjoy like cryptography steganography or what's your favorite field um well for me my favorite field either comes into uh, web application penetration testing or what i do for a living which is network penetration testing i really love red teaming that's really just what i enjoy 
Yeah, definitely. I feel my, like personally, my favorite is web application, uh, mainly because like just how creative you have to get with the different attacks. It's it's just amazing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And especially with all of the content management systems, all the various uh, web technologies that are being used, it's it really is an, a very exciting thing. And when you said, so you said you work in security full time, what, what do you normally, when you're going to penetrate a server, what do you start with? Like what, what's, what's your base that you always do to see and find vulnerabilities? Well, uh, first of all, we have to establish a scope as to what we're targeting. And of course, this is all uh, very, very unique depending on the project that you're talking about, right? So uh, various companies will ask us to you know, perform a complete red, uh, a red team assessment or simulation, whatever you want to call it. And so if we are targeting one server, as you've just explained, the first thing is we would need to get a scope of what exactly we're targeting. And then we need to understand what the server is built on. So the web technologies, whether it's using Apache, the LAMP stack, etc., getting to understand what services are running on it. Uh, and that can be disclosed by the company themselves. Uh, themselves. Uh, so either a white box test, uh, or if we're going in fully blind, then you have your black box. And we have different uh, sort of techniques for, uh, f for approaching each of these scenarios. Now, uh, if you want me to explain the tools that I can use, I can also uh, go into that if you want. So uh, le let me know what exactly you want me to explain. Yeah, I was just about to ask, do you have any like certain tools that you would use for different parts? And like, what would you recommend are the best ones for the, each different specific part of enumeration? All right. So for enumeration, so, you know, usually as you've as you've just mentioned, I'll use the example that you've mentioned. So if you're targeting a server and if it has um, if it has a web server and we are able, we are able to establish that. So we start off with our network scanners. Uh, so we use Nmap, which is extremely powerful, which is a lot of what a lot of us use. Uh, if there are firewalls that are protecting the server or the, the, that we have to ac actually go through, we use SCAPI or we use HPing to essentially test uh, the, the, um, the firewall first. Uh, and we essentially just go about it using Nmap and sort of uh, gaining a, an understanding of what exactly is, uh, is going to happen. And then we then move on to fuzzing, which uh, we, we use uh, quite a variety of tools. And so we, uh, again, as I said, depending on the scope and the, the, the type of test we're performing and the scale of the test, it varies in regards to uh, to, to the intensity and whether or not we're targeting one particular service. So usually for enumeration, we start off with Nmap, we take it really slow and we try and enumerate as much as possible before we start using SCAPI and we start using HPing to, to essentially start testing the, 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 um, well, the uh, stability of various services, whether or not we can perform denial of service, etc. So that's the first thing we usually go for. Yeah, of course. All right. Um... So, so when you're making a video, does it like, does, does the time that it takes you to make the video vary on how interested you are in the subject or do you just try and spread out the time for each video equally? Um, I usually take a uh, video idea one at a time. So uh, uh, if you've seen my website, I have uh, an area where you can actually post video suggestions. So I usually take suggestions from uh, the community and I actually have uh, like a, uh, an Excel spreadsheet where I have all of them lined up uh, for every every day of every uh, of every week of every month, etc. So uh, depending on the on, on the type of video, I usually take about one or two hours on research, getting everything right in regards to the facts, and then I can start making the video. Yeah. Um, what topics would you like to cover in your videos for the future that you haven't done yet? Um, one that I, I would say I haven't done as well as I wanted to was uh, Nmap. Of course, I, it's a tool that I use professionally and I, I really, really enjoy using it. So that's one of the tools I would like to use. I then also use a Cobalt Strike uh, or, you know, you, you, uh, I use Empire, which are both exploitation tools. And I would like to also cover them as well. They're more of an enterprise level tool. Uh, and that's probably where I would like to uh, start as well. Yeah, I've been looking into Empire quite a lot recently, and I've actually been really enjoying it. Yeah. Um, why do you feel it's so important to share information about hacking to the com online community? Is teaching the best way to share your knowledge? Um, yes, I, w I would certainly, I, I certainly feel so. And of course, I'm exploring various ways of sharing the information, whether it be through video uh, articles, um, various uh, posts, etc. Et you, you get the idea, sharing them across 
multiple platforms. But I, I think uh, the, the general importance around information security is that everyone should be aware of it. And uh, a, a lot of people now aren't, which is really sad. And uh, you see a lot of these huge data breaches and people's passwords getting stolen. It's just a huge quagmire where everyone's using various, uh, you know, commercial services. Uh, they're using social networks and they, they really aren't aware of the, the security behind them, how it works. And so, you know, I, I feel this is this is a way that we can actually empower the community and the public to get at least a very basic level of understanding. What? So obviously this might never happen. I, I feel like it probably won't. But if if what if one day you just run out of things to explain and like you've already explained everything that there is to explain, what will you move on to do? Will you try and like show people how you actually do it in real time or? Yeah, I actually have been thinking of making the, uh, a real type of video where I take it. Uh, yeah, I actually go. Uh, I actually take the. I record a video where I'm performing what I do usually uh, when I'm performing a penetration test. Now, of course, that also has its limitations, but uh, of course, this can be overcome by setting up a, a test scenario. And usually, what I do to replicate that is I usually do the hack the box. The, the various machines on Hack the Box, and that's pretty much what I used to simulate uh, my real job. But uh, as I said, uh, getting to a professional enterprise setup where 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 you have various uh, you know uh, uh, IDS and uh, firewalls, uh, that's something that I'm really interested in setting up so I can demonstrate various uh, evasion techniques and scanning techniques, and also then moving on to exploitation and whether or not it's a Windows operating system or a Linux server uh, looking at uh, exploitation, then post-exploitation, privilege escalation, etc. So looking really for, uh, my, my next focus would be looking at a very, very uh, large enterprise setup where I can, I can actually show you what works and what doesn't work. Yeah, I think, I think that would get a huge amount of attention. I haven't seen many pages that actually do that. Um, like in real situations, I've seen a lot of people that do CTFs and stuff like that, but it's like way too CTF to be actually useful to people that are trying to learn about real situations. Yeah, uh, I, I definitely think CTFs uh, help with, uh, with gaining experience with the tools you're using and getting a solid methodology. Uh, the only place where I think CTFs fall short is that they, they're essentially training you to look for flags, not for system misconfigurations, not for anything that could be potentially dangerous. Yeah, I've seen a couple of them where you just like you can just grab the flag. You can't actually get admin privilege and some people just like, all right, I got the flag. I can leave the box now. And like, really, you should be focusing on getting those elevated privileges. Yeah, and many people just, for some reason, after they've got the the root flag, they just leave the box without even you know uh, considering whether or not they can leave a back door. Uh, what what you do in in real life, really? Yeah, exactly. Um, have you ever thought of or done any black hat penetration testing? So not even penetration testing, just plain hacking, um, uh, whether it's for malicious intent or. I, I would say I did that when I was younger, and and that was probably something that I, I I don't really look back at very very fondly but uh, you, you know you, you when, when you're young when, when you're a, when you're a young kid in high school it's something that you just it, it just it just comes to be because you really want to you really want to show it, it's, it's just a really really weird situation where uh, you're, you're just trying to prove to well your peers that you can actually do something and uh, you know you, you you get the idea has that ever come back in like haunted you <laughs> like have you ever gone to a job interview or something and they've been like oh well we've seen you've done this in the past so we're not sure if we should trust you no no well when I actually what i actually classify as black hat was uh i haven't done anything uh, i haven't taken down anything commercial or i haven't hacked any anything commercial out of uh or, or you know any, anything that had real consequences or any, any i haven't done anything that had any uh, you know real consequences so what, what I did was uh, during school, I, I don't remember what exploit it was, but I actually was able to, in the computer lab, I was able to actually hack the administrator's computer because it was unpatched un, uh, and uh, unupdated. So I was able to actually hack it and I sort of deleted some of the important files 
And so I got uh, in a lot of trouble for that. So yeah, that's pretty much my only experience where I actually did something that wasn't uh, morally or ethically right. Yeah, of course. Um, well, so have you got like a favorite vulnerability that you just like, you either you love the way it works or like you just love how satisfying it is to see the little shell pop up or? Um, yeah, one, one of them is the Eternal Blue, uh, which is for Windows, right? So, um, uh, well, uh, that is, is something that I usually, I, 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 I like it because uh, if you are in a situation, and the only reason I like it is uh, if we are ever t- targeting a company that uses Windows 7, most likely 60% of the time, it'll be very easy to, to exploit them with that. That's if they're running the appropriate uh, service pack uh, that that uh, vulnerability is, uh, that that vulnerability target. So one uh, v- uh, Eternal Blue is one of them. So have you actually seen a lot of servers that are vulnerable to Eternal Blue? Because I've never actually come across one. I, I thought most of them have been patched. Yeah, mo- most of them have been patched. Now, w- what we're really talking about is, for example, uh, you will find uh, many executives who use their, their standard desktop on, on their desk for whatever work it is, whether it's office work, uh, you know, documents, etc. They're actually running, they're still running Windows 7 for some reason. Now, of course, this is not everyone. There are companies out there that are very, very, uh, they really keep up to date technology, uh, technologically speaking. So, uh, I, I still do f- find various uh, companies still running Windows 7. Okay. Um, and what, like, so your main aim for penetration testing, is that like to, to, to be recognized or to, to help people get into the field, to, to educate people? Um, my primary goal for the channel and the community is to actually get people into the, uh, into the community. And then from there on, they can see whether they're interested in it. And then obviously I take it a step further where I give them real world expertise in, in the tools that are used professionally or in, in the field. And so have you ever thought of going to a big event like Black Hat or DEF CON or something and doing talks there? Have you ever done talks in any um, big events? I have done them locally and uh, some uh, I have done internationally. But really, uh, when, when it comes down to events, the only reason why I can't attend events usually is because I'm extremely busy. I, I really just can't find even finding like about two days or something is, is going to be extremely difficult. So when I eventually do have time, I definitely want to visit these conferences. It's a fantastic area and place to be, you know, especially for learning new stuff. Yeah, of course. Um, there, are, there are a couple of questions here. They're all just asking really what what drove you into the, the field. I, I know you've explained that earlier. If you'd care to add anything like, did you... Did you hear from it from a friend or, or was it literally just looking on the internet and you saw someone chatting about hacking and you thought this is really, really interesting? All right. So my my, my intro story into hacking was, was almost a mistake. Uh, and if you give me the time, I, I'm sure I can explain it in like about two minutes yeah, or yeah. something. Yeah, we have, we have tons of time. All right. So when I was in high school, when I just got into high school, I think I was about maybe 12 or 13. I'm not too sure. And... Um, one of my first computers that I got, for some weird reason, came pre-installed with Ubuntu. Now, of course, that, that doesn't sound like anything important. And at the time, I was pretty pissed off because uh, at, at that age, everyone wanted to be playing games and Windows was pretty much the, the best operating system to have at the time. This was before I actually knew anything about programming, etc. So that was my first computer and I had Ubuntu. And at the time, a lot of my friends were telling me, you know, just, just get it wiped and uh, you can then install Windows. But for some reason, I stuck with Ubuntu and I also started getting uh, very, very familiar with forums. Now, the the way I got familiar with these forums is because I would have various issues with my distribution where I would have errors that I could not explain, you know, uh, because this is my first time using Linux. So I would essentially search for the errors I was getting and I I was able to fix some of them, but I really mucked up my first distribution. That's the truth. And then one, uh, once, I, I don't exactly remember the forum name, but I was able to actually find uh, a distribution called Backtrack. All right, now Backtrack was the first penetration testing distribution out there. And this is something that really intrigued me. It was, uh, it, it had very weird words that I had never heard of before. We we're talking about penetration testing, uh, privilege escalation. So I got really excited and actually got it installed and uh, it was just, it was, it was wow, you know, the, the first whole week, I, I actually don't think I went to school for about three days after I got it installed, where I was just 
like just exploring it, checking out what the different tools do. And I then started researching. I found, you know, the uh, Nmap was my first tool that I ever used and understood how to use. So it was amazing, you know. Speaking of distributions, do you have a favorite distribution? Are you currently using Kali, Para? Have you like got a main one that you always turn to whenever starting a pen test? Um, when, whenever starting a pen test, well, usually when we're starting a pen test, we don't, uh, we usually deploy a virtual private server with Debian and, uh, we then have the pen testers framework, which is what we use to install all the necessary tools. Now, when it comes down to a personal choice or personal preference for penetration testing, I usually, I like black box or, uh, uh, is it black box or back box? I'm not too sure what it's called exactly. Uh, I actually really, really like that operating system. It has what uh, it, it has a very, very good stability. Uh, and uh, second to that, I I really prefer using Kali Linux. Mm. Um, I found that Parrot lately, especially in the recent updates, has been quite a lot stronger than Kali. When I used to be in Kali, I used to get crashes like monthly. It was just a really, really, really annoying thing. Yeah. Parrot is getting really, really better. It's, 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 it's being improved constantly now. The only issue with Parrot is is the stability. Now, of course, as as you've just mentioned, it's getting it's getting really, really good now. And of course, I have to put it through one of these tests before. But the the only reason why I'm not really in favor of it in in the in the commercial world is because I did actually try and use it once and it failed on me. Now, now that was very, very early on. I think it was version, um, I think it was version three, if I'm not wrong. And that actually failed on me. I know it's been a while, so I'll definitely try it again. I have used it on a couple of my videos, and it seems to be working extremely smoothly uh, without any hitches. Yeah, the the only downside to Parrot really that I've found is all the colors. It can be quite, it can stand out quite a lot when you compare it to Kali, since Kali is just a default black, white. Yeah, Kali has kept it pretty simple when it comes down to its theme. So yeah, it's it's just it's just what it is, man. Yeah, of course. Um, I've got quite a quite a strange question here. Um, what do you recommend to a fifteen slash sixteen year old kid who loves cybersecurity but has almost no time for HTB or CTFs? Um, I would recommend reading uh, the appropriate books. That's that's really what I would recommend. Looking back, I, I would recommend reading a lot of the, um, the the great books that are out there. One of them being the Hacker Playbook, uh, and uh, the um, I actually forget uh, the title of the book. Uh, is it the Art of Exploitation? That those were really important books for me to read, uh, and I I still keep on coming back to them. Do you prefer videos or, or books? Because personally, every book that I've read, I haven't really learned much. I've learned a lot more from seeing someone actually do it and understanding how it works and stuff. Yeah. Now, now, now this is something very important. This is something that I realized is different with everyone. Now, personally, I learn by reading. That's That, that may sound really, really weird, but what, what usually happens is, is I read a book, I learn, and then I do. All right? So, uh, w with different people I've seen, they usually like listening. Um, so you usually find people who who actually prefer listening and looking at someone do something rather than reading. Now, uh, if, if you, you really should find out what type of person you are in that way. So if you don't find yourself uh, liking or, uh, or understanding what's what's going on when you're reading, then definitely try out videos. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you have any advice for someone that's like starting in the field, maybe has a little time in the field but wants to go so a bit more of a professional level from CTFs? Like, do you have any advice for where they should start looking? Um, yeah, as I said, and I'll say it again, definitely, uh, if, if you have mastered them, then, uh, then, then you're pretty much good to go. Uh, but I would really recommend that you really are very, very good with Linux and networking. So uh, again, I'll keep on reiterating it, but it's extremely important. Do you recommend someone get started in bug bounties instead of directly going to look for a company? Um, if, if it's something you enjoy and it's something that you're really good at, then, then I see no harm in doing so. But of course, as I always have to throw this disclaimer out, if you're getting into the industry for money or for a payment or you're, you're really doing this for money, then I, 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 I'm sorry to say, but it's, it's not going to be it's not going to be very, very good for you. Now, of course, people doing bug bounties are earning uh, very, very good amounts of money. And, you know, kudos to them. The professionals have been in there for a while now. 
and so they are earning uh, everything uh, it's it's really they're doing what they love and and, and they're earning from it now of course if, you, if this is also something that, that's uh, that's there for you you're really passionate about web application security and you're able to do it then definitely go ahead and do so the bounties are there to encourage you and to help the companies that set them out yeah i completely agree i feel like bug bounties can be a bit unreliable and you, you're not always sure if you're gonna get a bug bug bounty that month but like as people do it because they enjoy doing it so it's like they're working while they're having fun so it doesn't really matter to them if they're gonna find a bug bounty or not yeah uh, usually i i've seen that with a lot of my friends who are actually bug bounty hunters well not full time but they do it and they earn quite a, a bit of money and they just really enjoy doing it you can find them doing it on weekends it's just something that they actually enjoy so yeah if, if you if you enjoy it go ahead and do it man yeah um what do you think about the recent database breaches with the massive 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 dumps that have just been circulating around the internet yeah now, now this is where i come into play professionally and again i can tell you that this is just as a result of misconfiguration of services and of course i'm simplifying it a lot with huge companies, what happens is there is so much infrastructure in infrastructure to manage that usually what happens is that a few aspects of of, uh, of the security protocols and the security policies get overlooked. All right. Now, when it comes down to the data breach, if you don't take security seriously and you do not look at every bit of your infrastructure, this is what's going to happen because uh, the the truth of the matter is hackers are increasing around the world and they're going to keep on targeting various companies and mm -hmm. this is pretty much what they're going to be doing. So companies really, really need to step down uh, or step up really and uh, really take a look at the infrastructure, create uh, really, really good security policies and uh, security standards, abide by the standards, get themselves audited by a security company and fully test their services against uh, e even the harshest of conditions uh, so, yeah, that's what I think. And th these things are, are just going to keep on happening. Do you recommend big companies use um, like open source software or, or like anything that anyone has access to just because of how like how secure they could be? But also, the, I guess the downside to that is that if someone finds a zero day and one of them, all of them will be vulnerable. Yeah, we, we actually saw that with uh, OpenSSH earlier last year or later last year, I'm not too sure when it actually happened, where uh, a lot of people use OpenSSH on their servers. And uh, one zero day was actually found in an older version that had almost, uh, I'm not too sure, uh, about a few million uh, servers r running on them. And most importantly, Amazon AWS actually had various servers running op uh, that version of OpenSSH. So uh, either way, whether you're running propriet uh, proprietary software or you're running open source software, I think it all comes down to the development team behind the project and whether or not they take security seriously. Um, speaking of security, you said earlier that you use Tor quite often. Do you consider that to be secure enough or do you have like VPNs or proxies or anything on top of using Tor? Yeah, um, that really depends on what you're trying to achieve with your anonymity or whether you're trying to achieve full privacy. So usually what people uh, don't understand is if you're using Tor, uh, none of your browsing activity is going to be stored anywhere. That, that, that's the whole design behind it. All right. It's uh, that was the initial uh, inspiration behind it. When you're talking about using VPNs, uh, depending on the VPN provider, your logs are kept uh, on, on the various servers. And of course, you have a few of them like NordVPN, which do not actually save your logs on their server and are not uh, and actually registered in, in countries that do not have to abide to certain uh, data disclosure laws. So they don't have to disclose or they don't have to. And uh, uh, and they they really can't because they do not keep your logs on, on their server. So. Uh, when it comes down to VPNs, I would say be uh, be really cautious with the ones you choose if that's what you're trying to use it for. I don't know what everyone's trying to achieve uh, and why they want privacy and an anonymity. But if you're doing something illegal, then uh, I, I would really recommend sticking with Tor. That's my advice. Yeah, um, I, I didn't actually know that. I thought that all VPNs kept logs, but some of them, what they did was encrypt their logs to such a level 
that not even they could decrypt it. So that when the authorities ask them, can we have your logs to check for so-and-so, then they'll, they'll give them the logs. But since it's all encrypted, they won't be under, able to um, understand anything from it. Yeah, uh, a lot of them have actually uh, gone to doing this. And of course, it is illegal, uh, given the various data disclosure laws, especially around Europe, where if you actually, if, if there is an instance where they do request data of a customer and you tell them that the data is encrypted, uh, you're going to have to decrypt it or th there's going to be a fine. So uh, really, it's either you have the logs or you don't. So yeah, I, I think that that's also a very good step taken by uh, by the VPN companies to essentially put them in a situation where they are abiding by the laws in sort of a in a half transparent way and uh, where they're encrypting it. So that, that's also a very, a very good step taken by them. Yeah, of course. Um, do you have any future collaborations that you would like to do with anyone like uh, do you do you, have you ever thought of maybe doing any joint videos with john hammond or live overflow um definitely these are very uh brilliant guys uh, who, who really are very very good in in their particular niches and uh when i'm talking about for example like john hammond who i think i watched a bit uh, like half of his uh, ama last week uh uh, yeah, I would definitely uh, like to have a collaboration with them on various uh, topics and uh, whether it is a CTF, etc. And uh, we then have Live Overflow is extremely good with, you know, reverse. So it's uh, I, I'm really looking forward to and definitely I will be in contact with them over possible collaborations on various topics. So, yeah, that's something that uh, I am quite interested in doing. Um, Yeah, I, I'm really looking forward to that. I think that just seeing all of the main icons for like the hacking community especially on youtube because i've seen it's growing quite quickly it would just be really cool to see maybe you guys will like go do a challenge like the end game on hack the box which is really really hard by the way <laughs> yeah for, for for sure that, that's that, that's in fact that's a very good idea so uh I'll, I'll definitely look out for that and keep that in mind and of course i'll, I'll reach out to them and uh, we'll see if we can make it happen yeah. Um, what do you think of IPv6? Do you think IPv4 will ever be replaced or do you think IPv4 is just always going to be a standard? Uh, IPv4 is going to be replaced in the next three to five years uh, because the current spectrum of IPs is actually, it's getting depleted. So and a lot of people, no, well, no, no one really uses IPv6. So it's sort of like a failed protocol. Uh, and so I think there will be a, a newer version that they will implement uh, so that we can have a newer, uh, sort of a, a newer spectrum of addresses. Yeah, I, I, I don't mind IPv6. I've just seen that it's quite a lot harder to like use and actually understand than IPv4. Uh, uh, f from a design perspective, IPv6 is actually simpler in in terms of how it was built. It was actually it it really is brilliant when you take a look at the headers. Uh, and you you sort of understand the difference between IPv6 and IPv4. It really is much better, but again, it just uh, it really did not catch uh, catch on. Have you ever considered leaving your full time job as a security manager or whatever, and just going completely freelance and just working just on the go? Yeah, I did do that, and and I I still uh, I still really enjoy doing it. When when I was doing it, I. It, it, exp uh, it well actually had to travel from time to time from different countries to different countries uh, performing uh, these various tests so yeah i did enjoy it but after a while it gets really tiresome and cumbersome so uh, i really just I, I really like sticking to one place where i can i can actually i, I have a, a good control of what i'm doing yeah do you have any thoughts on the laws related to hacking because obviously hacking and technology and everything has advanced quite a lot faster than the law itself so it's been quite hard to actually keep up on what should be punishable and how hard they should go on the punishment um actually the someone that used to be in the anonymous group literally ddosed the police website and they got 15 years in jail and they've just been on the run ever since but what what do you what do you think about that do you think that the law will ever catch up to how fast technology is advancing um, I, I, I do think it will in some aspects, especially this year where you're seeing huge regulations and bills that are going to be signed in, in and by the EU, for example, Article 13, which is going to change a lot of things online. 
Now, when it comes down to the laws governing various cyber attacks and data breaches, etc., if they do ever or are able to point a finger at someone at the people responsible, uh, well, one of the consensus uh, by, by everyone in the security in, in the security industry is that if you ever do such a thing, or if a group ever does that, then uh, the uh, the time or the amount punishable is is supposed to be in direct proportion to to the amount that you actually uh, cause the company to lose. For example, if you perform a denial of service on a huge company and the end up and the end up losing fifteen million dollars or something uh, or something on that lines, then you should be uh, uh, punished appropriately or in direct correlation to the amount that you actually caused that company to lose. Now, now that's one of the the consensus that, that was brought up in the security community. And of course, we're waiting to hear uh, others that hopefully should streamline uh, the punishments for various uh, uh, types of attacks. Speaking of um, Article 13, do you think, is that, I haven't actually looked off on that much. Has that actually been assured now? Is that, are we sure that's going to happen or is there still like a vote or something that needs to go through? Um, it's going to be signed, I think, in the, I think in January this month or next month, and depending on whether or not it's signed, it's going to affect a, a lot of content online. So it'll be very interesting to see how that pans out. And someone's speaking here about operating systems again. They're asking, "Have you heard of Cube OS?" Yes, I have heard of Cube OS. I actually made a video of it. If I if I don't actually. If I actually recall correctly, but yes, I have heard of it. It's a very, very good operating system for its, um, uh, well, it, I, I would say it's used for a very particular uh, use case scenario. Um, it says here virtualizing everything for security. Do you think that's that's a good way to go about security? I've seen many ways uh, of actually doing this, but we know I, I've worked with a few uh uh, with a few engineers before who uh, have really have designed malware to actually infiltrate various virtualized or sandboxed environments. That's essentially what Cubes OS is doing is it's sort of it's sort of virtualizing every aspect of an operating system and sort of keeping it isolated from uh, from one another. So yes, it, it is a very good uh, direction to take. But is it flawed? Yes, it is flawed. Uh, is it perfect? Definitely not. Yeah, but then again, everything is going to have flaws. You're never going to find the perfect system that will have no vulnerabilities. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's a very good uh, solution, and a lot of uh, top people use it. For example, Edward Snowden, uh, of course, over the last one year, he has switched his operating system, and is I think I'm not too sure. I don't want to be quoted incorrectly, but uh, I'll actually check up on that and update you guys on that as well. Yeah, for sure. Um. Someone here wants to know what you think about the Internet of Things security. Yeah, that's uh, that's something that's going to come into play now as we move further into that, uh, as we sort of digitize everything in, in, in our world and we sort of have all of these devices around. Uh, again, as I said, we, we, we are going to really uh, need to, to have certain laws and certain policies uh, in regards to how these devices are manufactured how they communicate with each other uh, and and how and 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 their their various security protocols now many of the manufacturers of these various iot devices again do not well I, i'm not going to say all of them uh, many of them do not incorporate the uh, security into their development life cycle which is uh, extremely dangerous Th they do tend to use open source software but again as we've seen that is still flawed so until we have companies really implementing good security policies into the development cycle, then we will. We, we uh, that's when I expect to see a, a, a change for the good in terms of security. But until then, I think we're going to see a lot of attacks on on various IoT devices. All right. Well, that that's it. That's all the questions. Thank you so much for coming. I think uh, I'm not sure how this works after. I guess. Um, people have time to ask questions if they have any extra ones just in chat. Um, but if not, really good to have you on. I've really been looking forward to talking to you. Sure. Thank you very much for having me on and a uh, fantastic community you have here. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, look forward to your future collaborations and videos. I think that's really going to be something to, to look out for, especially when it comes to such a massive subject like cybersecurity. Yeah. All right. So uh, should I just start answering the various questions? 
Um, yeah, sure. Maybe I'll read them out for the video because I think someone's recording. Oh, all right. Um, what do you, HS, think of VM structure? Having one host and many VMs categorized in trusted slash untrusted. Um, well, if, if that's the sort of infrastructure you're going for, then I would really recommend uh, sort of isolating them uh, from one, one another or having them work on different uh, networking interface or network interface cards. So that's what I would recommend. It's a very good way of securing your system. But again, I think it, uh, it, it can have a lot of disadvantages, especially if you're dealing with malware, etc. All right. Absolutely perfect. Thank you so much for coming on. Hopefully have you on sometime in the future again. Um, yeah, it's been really good. Thank sure. you so much for taking the time. Thank you very much. Thanks.